about um, some of the work in my lab that's focused on understanding genetic and fitness consequences of dispersal. Um, so as many of you probably know already, dispersal or just like the movement of individuals across a landscape is really important in influencing biological processes at several different levels. So for instance, um, individual dispersal patterns will have a large impact on levels of inbreeding for different individuals, which may have fitness outcomes um, for individuals and for populations as a whole. On a slightly larger uh, spatial scale, dispersal will um, largely control kind of patterns of spatial genetic structure that we can observe over a landscape. And finally, over kind of longer time scales and larger spatial scales, um, dispersal behaviors play a large role in governing meta population dynamics. And over longer evolutionary time, also governs kind of the um, process of speciation and whatnot. So understanding the impact of dispersal uh, is important for answering a number of different questions in evolutionary biology and also has important applications for conservation efforts. So for instance, um, without a good understanding of kind of long-term genetic and fitness consequences of dispersal, it's difficult for us to predict how populations will respond to habitat fragmentation, which is a huge problem for um, species worldwide. And understanding kind of long-term effects of dispersal is also really important to evaluate the effectiveness of translocations for genetic rescue, which is, I think, a fairly hotly debated um, potential management uh, program in conservation these days. So the problem is, is that studying the consequences of dispersal can be really difficult. Um, in an ideal scenario, you would want to be able to have direct measures of dispersal distance. Um, a lot of uh, studies don't have the ability to actually track individual movements and therefore have to make inferences about dispersal distance from molecular markers or other um, analysis methods. Uh, ideally, you would want to be able to identify immigrant individuals into your study population and finally, if you're interested in understanding fitness consequences, especially long-term fitness consequences, then you also need the ability to accurately measure um, levels of reproductive success for several individuals across multiple generations. And so because of kind of these issues with studying dispersal, one of the best study systems for asking questions about um, the consequences of dispersal are actually long-term demographic studies. So these are studies where individuals have been um, individually marked and monitored over several years, uh, which then basically provides information on individual fitness. Um, sometimes there's in information on dispersal distance or at least kind of clear identification of immigrants. And also these studies um, often provide accurate information on the population pedigree or the set of relationships among all individuals in the population. And this pedigree information allows you to quantify individual reproductive success over time. So what I'm gonna do today is kind of summarize some of the work that our lab has done looking at genetic and fitness consequences of dispersal among populations. And the system that we use uh, to ask these questions is the Florida scrub jay. This is this beautiful blue bird. It's a cooperative breeder, so individuals um, delay dispersal and stay at home to help their parents raise future offspring. These birds are restricted to this unique fire-maintained scrub habitat in Florida that has been largely destroyed due to anthropogenic um, pressures. And so this bird is federally threatened and a lot of the work in the lab uh, has important conservation implications. There are a few aspects about the biology of the species that makes it particularly amenable to long-term demographic studies. So first, they're non-migratory, they're highly territorial and philopatric, so it's fairly easy to follow individuals and their offspring throughout their lifespans. And also they're socially and mostly genetically monogamous, which means that we can construct fairly accurate pedigrees using field observations alone.
So one population of Florida scrub jays has been intensively studied at Archibald Biological Station since 1969. Um, Every month we go out and census the entire population so we have accurate information on individual lifespans. We also have detailed breeding records so we can estimate um, lifetime reproductive annual and lifetime reproductive success for all the individuals in our population. Um, we also map all of the territories and so we can estimate uh, natal dispersal distances so the distance uh, between where an individual was born and where it establishes as a breeder. Over the past 50 years, we've also collected kind of extensive pedigree information. So this kind of like blob of dots and lines is um, our multi-generational pedigree. We have about 10,000 individuals on the pedigree. And for about 4,000 of these individuals, we have collected um, genomic data. So we designed a custom Illumina uh, B-chip to genotype about 4,000 individuals at um, 12,000 SNPs across the genome. And the histogram on the bottom shows you the total number of individuals in our popu study population over time in gray and the number of genotyped individuals in blue. So as you can see, we've genotyped nearly every individual in our population for the past decade plus, allowing us to look at kind of allele frequency dynamics um, over time. So from looking at the demographic data, one of the first things we realized was that there's fairly high levels of immigration into the population and the number of immigrants appearing in our population over time has been decreasing. This is largely because the surrounding area is not, the habitats in the surrounding areas are not maintained. And so we're seeing kind of large decreases in um, numbers of Js in our surrounding areas. And what this, uh, has caused is essentially the proportion of the adult breeding individuals in our population over time has decreased from around 55% in 1995 down to around 30% in 2013. So there's been a kind of dramatic drop in the number of immigrant individuals present in our population over time. We then use the genotype data to try to learn more about these immigrants. And the first pattern we found was that um, immigrant individuals were significantly less heterozygote than resident individuals, so Js that were born in our study area. Here I'm showing you kind of mean genome-wide heterozygosity for immigrants in yellow and residents in blue in our population over time. You can see that um, heterozygosity is much higher for our resident birds. But despite the fact that our immigrants are likely more inbred, um, they were also they were still really important in contributing levels of genetic variation to our population. So on the bottom here, I'm showing you kind of mean pairwise identity by descent. So this is essentially a measure of how related individuals are using our genomic data. Um, and you can see in the blue line where uh, residents are much more related to each other than they are to immigrants um, shown in green and yellow. And over time, if we look at kind of um, relatedness levels of all male-female pairs in our population, which is the line shown in gray, you can see that it is slightly increasing over time. So we actually wanted to model uh, and try to ask, okay, we know that immigrants are important in contributing genetic variation because they're less related to our resident individuals, but how much are they actually contributing? So we can use um, simulations using our pedigree to estimate uh, the expected genetic contribution of incoming immigrants. So what I mean by expected genetic contribution is what proportion of the alleles present in the birth cohort in any given year is expected to have been inherited identical by descent from an incoming immigrant. And so if we, um, kind of treat all of the individuals in our population as residents in 1990, we can see that by 2013, about 75% of the genetic variation we see in our population at that point um, was brought in via an immigrant um, appearing in our population from 91 onwards. And the color lines simply show kind of the added contribution of each incoming cohort of immigrants. Something else that's kind of fun is um, in Florida scrub jays, we have strongly female bias dispersal. So most of our incoming immigrants are female. 
And so we can actually look at kind of how much of the genetic variation that's being brought in via immigration is uh, being contributed from males versus females. So for a given autosomal locus, um, we can plot the expected genetic contribution of female immigrants in green and male immigrants in purple. And as expected, uh, there's a higher contribution of female immigrants, which makes sense um, because we have a lot, most of our immigrants coming into this population are females. However, uh, for sex, the sex chromosomes or markers on the sex chromosome, um, the pattern is flipped. So in birds, um, females are the heterogametic sex. So females have ZW sex chromosomes and males have ZZ chromosomes. This means that every incoming male immigrant brings in two copies of the Z chromosome, uh, whereas females only bring in one copy. So as you can see here, the expected contribution of male immigrants is actually higher than the expected genetic contribution of female immigrants. Um, and we've also done some other studies uh, to show that in fact, not only are um, incoming immigrants, so kind of dispersal of individuals into our study population, not only do they contribute a lot to observed levels of genetic variation, but in fact, um, we can demonstrate that gene flow is actually important in driving kind of patterns of allele frequency change that we see at certain SNPs across the genome. So why does this matter? Um, we, because of decreasing immigration into our population, we actually see increasing levels of inbreeding in our birth cohort over time. Um, and because of strong inbreeding depression, we actually see decreased kind of juvenile survival um, in our population over time. And we can do models to show that, um, in fact, this is a causal, it's not just a correlation, but it's a causal relationship. So a lot of the variation in inbreeding coefficients over time is, um, in fact, explained by the variation in uh, immigration rates. Okay, so to summarize, um, hopefully I've shown you that gene flow is a very important contributor to levels of genetic variation in our population over time. Um, and because of reduced immigration into our population, we actually see increasing levels of inbreeding and reduced fitness. This is was especially concerning because the census population size of our study population has remained stable over time. So it seemed demographically stable. And it was only by kind of using genetics that we could start to see signatures of population decline in our population. I'd like to thank our, my wonderful team of collaborators and especially the many students and staff who collected the data at Archival Biological Station over the past half century. Thank you to my funding agencies and also thank you all for listening. I'm happy to take questions if there's time. Awesome, thank you, Nancy. <laughs> Um, so if anybody have questions, please type a question mark or your question in the chat. So Raina said, such a cool system. Do you know where most of your immigrant J's come from? That is something that I wish I knew. Um, they're likely coming from peripheral populations to the north and the south, because um, much of the scrub habitat exists along this like linear ridge, but we have no idea how many populations they're coming from. And that's something that we hope that we can answer by going out and sampling additional populations. I have a quick question. This is Darrell. Uh -huh. uh, that was a great talk. I once worked on the song from Mindarty Island, and we saw that immigrants brought in larger legs and different wing sizes. And I'm wondering if your immigrants added to the genetic variation in um, quantitative traits in your population. That's a great question. We haven't actually looked at variation, like differences in morphological traits between residents and immigrants, um, but that is death. Uh, it's something we could do. The one caveat is that we, these J's are really hard to track. So we don't have that many um, measurements of adult birds. So that comparison is gonna be a little bit trickier, but. Uh, we have ongoing work trying to like really fine tune differences in reproductive success and um, maybe reproductive behaviors between immigrants and immigrant offspring and residents. Thank you. So, 
Philip said, great talk. How does this compare to migration and non-cooperatively breeding patterns? Um, how does this compare to, that's a good question. Um, I think that it largely depends on the biology of the species. So scrub jays are unique in that they are not unique, but they don't migrate at all and they have fairly limited dispersal. We do see, and so a lot of our patterns are caused by this kind of strong preference for limited dispersal. Um, and I don't really know, like I think there's a really wide variation in dispersal distances across passerines. So, and I don't think this is like a unique characteristic, so characteristic of cooperative breeders. Sorry, I don't really have an answer. <laughs> No, that, that was a good answer. There's 10,000 species of panther, panther, passerine, so or 5,000, so that's a that's a hard question. So I'm sorry. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Felix Beardry. Felix is currently a postdoc with Nancy at the University of Rochester. And, but he's currently in Toronto. And today he's going to talk about work that he did in Toronto during, during his PhD. Um, and the title of his talk is Genomics of Facultative Group Living in Black Widow Spiders. Hi, thanks for introducing me. Uh, let me open my slideshow. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. Great, uh, thanks. Um, my name is Felix, as was said, and I'm gonna present some Cool work on black widow spiders and facultative group living. And so the uh, main question that we're inspired by in this project is asking questions about the transition from solitary living to species where there's uh, prolonged cooperative group living. Uh, a classic example is uh, bees. Um, but in this project, we study black widows. And uh, black widow spiders aren't known for their cooperative living. Most people think of uh, black widow spiders in the context of either their venom or maybe their cannibalistic um, behavior during mating. But some populations of black widow spiders um, do live in uh, seasonal groups uh, sharing webs under logs. And we're interested in what are the genomic consequences of this uh, social polymorphism. And so these uh, populations that uh, that are facultatively group living uh, are from coastal British Columbia. So CBC, I'll be using this um, yellow to represent this group for the rest of the talk. And preliminary work by Charmaine Condi using mitochondrial sequencing suggesting that these um, coastal British Columbia populations are very distinct from uh, even very close by other populations. So we can look at these. Um, inland BC populations in red, and they uh, are they cluster quite distantly on a phylogeny of the mitochondria. And so taking these two, um, this behavioral polymorphism and this genetic distinction together, uh, we think it's a pretty solid system for some cool uh, genomic questions. So the two questions I'll be asking today uh, are, do we see changes in breeding structure associated with this group living? And can we see any signals of local adaptation? And for this work, um, I've got two amazing collaborators that I'd like to call out to. Uh, Nishant Singh has done all the behavioral work. And so he is um, rearing these spiders in the lab, doing common garden behavioral trials of uh, individuals whose parents are from three different populations, from coastal British Columbia, uh, California labeled CA, and from Texas, I'll be labeling that TX. And then along with that uh, very cool behavioral data set, um, I've been do running analyses on a RADSeq uh, set generated by Lindsay Miles. And that's uh, for samples across the whole range. And see, we have here uh, the dots, the, the blue and red dots representing the RADSeq samples. And so the first question we were interested in asking, do we see changes in breeding structure associated with these facultatively group living black widows? And what Nishant saw is that in the group living populations, 
kin prefer to mate with kin over non-kin. And in contrast, if we look in Texas populations, we see that uh, individuals have no preference in mating with kin or non-kin. And in California, individuals actually prefer to mate with non-kin over kin. And if we look at the genetics of these same populations, and so here on the x-axis, I've got all the populations we sampled, uh, but I've uh, added arrows to the populations for which we have behavioral data. And on the uh, y-axis here, I've got inbreeding estimated by FS FIS, and a random um, mating pattern is at zero, so this dotted gray line. And what we're seeing is that these populations that uh, prefer to mate with kin that are also our facultatively uh, group living populations have more uh, homozygosity than we'd expect from random mating. Uh, in contrast, the population in California where we see preference for non-kin mating has more heterozygosity than we'd expect from random mating. And uh, our Texas population follows the same expectation. And so together, the, both the behavioral and the genetic uh, results do suggest that we see a, a transition in the mating system associated with this behavioral uh, group living. So the second question I was interested in addressing is, do we see any signals of local adaptation in these populations? This is interesting in the context of what are the ecological reasons for transitioning to group living? And so first we were interested in asking, do we see genetic differentiation at the nuclear level for these coastal uh, BC populations that are facultatively group living? We took a uh, principal component analysis of the first, uh, sorry, 50,000 SNPs from the nuclear genome. And uh, this graph on the left is showing uh, those results. Each dot here is an individual. I've colored them from the state that they're from for a rough proxy of um, geography. And we see that the first principal component seems to separate our individuals between mountain and coastal populations. But our second principal component separates out the coastal BC populations from everyone else. If we take each of these SNPs that participate in principal component two and ask what is their effect size to this separation, we see a strong correlation with genetic differentiation as estimated by FSD per SNP. And so we're seeing that these large uh, PC2 effect size SNPs also have very large FST values. And in fact, these very large uh, PC2 effect sizes are often fixed differences between coastal British Columbia and the rest of the Western Black Widow populations. And so uh, we do find evidence that there is genetic differentiation between these populations. And so what we were interested in asking are, do we see evidence in these genes where we see genetic differentiation? Um, do we also see alleles that co-vary with climate? So what I'm showing here is a climate PCA. Um, here there's no genetic uh, data. All we're showing is the um, climactic variation across the range of the Western Black Widow. We see that the primary uh, axis of variation for climate is from wet to dry, with our coastal BC populations being at the extreme wet end. And our second principal component is from stays hot, so we can imagine California, to gets cold, which is more mountainous uh, climate. And so if we're interested in finding correlations between this climate and allele frequencies, the problem is a lot of populations that live in similar climates also have, uh, are also next to each other. If we think of our, my California example, these populations are all in the same climate space, but they're also next to each other. So gene flow could be uh, homogenizing allele frequencies between these populations. And so to find a signal of a, an allele frequency that co-varies with climate, we need to control or at least manage uh, the information uh, from neutral gene flow. And so what we did for this is we estimate gene flow between each population, we make that as a matrix, and then we can take the principal component of that matrix. So yes, a third principal component analysis representing uh, yet another thing. So here what I'm showing you is the principal component of gene flow, uh, each dot here representing one population, uh, and its location estimated from the gene flow um, in that population estimated from allele frequencies for each individual within that population. And this gene flow uh, 
matrix PCA is replicating the, the same results that we saw in the individual based PCA, where the first principal component separates out our mountain from coastal populations, and our second principal component separates the BC, coastal BC, um, facultatively group living populations from everyone else. And so now we can ask what um, allele frequencies are best explained by neutral gene flow and what uh, allele frequencies are actually best explained by variation in climate. So to do that, we use the software BayPass. Um, this is a Bayesian framework. And so the statistical significance threshold in this analysis is 20 decibands. And uh, so um, SNPs that we see having a significant association um, are uh, across 78 genes. Um, and so we were interested now in asking what climate factors are this varying with and how does this relate back to our um, differentiation from British Columbia. What we're seeing, if we add to the x-axis, the effect size from the SNP PC2 that I showed earlier, these high values of uh, PC2 effect size are often correlated with very high uh, values of FST. In this case, these are all fixed differences um, between British Columbia and the rest of the range. And then we can also add color for our different principal component analyses. So uh, I've colored based on the top five climate principal components, um, but the, uh, the top two are shown here in orange and red. So um, we only found five genes that both had a fixed difference in British Columbia and a statistical association with climate. Um, and of those five, only two had homologs in the NCBI BLAST database. But the two that we did find were quite exciting. And I think uh, the one that I found the most interesting was this association between the uh, variation between gets hot and stays, uh, sorry, stays hot, gets cold uh, with the neuropeptide latrotoxin, which is the active component in the venom of the uh, black widow spiders for which they're uh, famous. And uh, the other um, gene that we found the blast hit to was a prey wrapping slug protein. So altogether, uh, we found a series of factors that are associated with spider sociality um, in the, the Western black widow, but these are consistent with other studies of uh, sociality in spiders. We see a preference towards kin mating. We see an increase towards genetic relation, relatedness in these populations, and we see a statistical association with a te temperate wet climate. And so I'd really like to thank uh, my supervisor on this project, Median Andrade, and the whole of the Andrade lab, and Nishant Singh, Charmaine Condi, and Lindsay Miles for their uh, collaboration on this project, and the University of Toronto Scarborough. And I'd love to ask any questions. Thank you, Felix. What a cool system. Um, questions for Felix? Okay, if not, I wanna thank Felix for the great talk once again. And I am going to introduce the next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Kay Spell. Kay is a curator at the Natural History Museum of LA County. The title of her talk is Distangling Lousy Relationship, Comparative Genomics, Phylogenomics of Chipmunk and Suckling Lice. Case, I think you're muted. Thanks, sorry about that. I'm used to using Zoom and having easier control over it. But thanks everyone, and thanks Athena for putting this together. I'm gonna to talk to you today about some of the work that I've done with chipmunks and their sucking lice. So kind of my overall theme for my research is to test the importance of host association, host demographic history, geography, and climate as factors that shape parasite evolution. And one of the points of this that I'm really interested in is if we can identify patterns or processes that are shared between parasites, 
that may give us some insight into processes that can shape diversification or parasitism across multiple species of parasites. Uh, the system that I work on is chipmunks, and they're the small rodents. You've probably all seen them or know what I speak of. They're these cute little squirrels that live across Western North America. There's also one species in Eastern North America, the Eastern chipmunk, as well as one in Asia, the Asian or Eurasian chipmunk. There's 23 species in Western North America. They all belong to one subgenus. And they've diversified relatively recently. So within the last 4 million years, they've diversified into these 23 species that we see today. And their distribution is shown here by these colored outlines. And that's just to point out that there's many instances where species overlap, which have not only provided opportunities for introgression or hybridization between species, but it also provides lots of opportunities for parasites to move among different host species. The parasite that I'm going to talk about today is the sucking louse. So these are small wingless insects that feed on blood and they spend their entire life cycle on their host. So they're like the human sucking lice in the sense that they cling to the fur or the hair and they feed on the blood, they mate on the host, they lay their eggs on the host, and they actually have very few opportunities to move between different host individuals. They're generally thought that they're primarily transmitted from mother to offspring, but they can also move any time that chipmunks come into contact could, that could be, you know, in fighting or mating or other interactions. Western chipmunks host two species of sucking lice, Apoplura arboricola, which is shown here with the blue, and it's going to be denoted by that blue silhouette throughout the rest of the talk. And then the one on the bottom is Neohaematopinus pacificus, which is again going to be highlighted by that red. And these, both of these species of lice have been found from most species of western chipmunks. Um, I suspect that if we look hard enough, we will recover both of those species of lice from all species of western chipmunks. I just haven't been able to get around to looking thoroughly at all the species yet. So with this system and these parasites in mind, the questions I'm going to talk about today is, are how have parasites diversified with respect to hosts? And are there processes or conditions dictating divergence and host switching that are shared across the parasite species? So this is trying to get at that angle of identifying patterns or processes that maybe could be a little bit more generalized in the things that happen across multiple parasite species. We, I did this with a phylogenomics approach. Um, all of these samples came from either fieldwork, which was about 800 individual hosts. Of, I examined 19 host species, but for a few of those species, I only had one or two individuals, so it wasn't um, ideal. But then in addition to that, I complemented that with uh, museum study skins. So what we do there is we comb a museum study skin, actually using a human louse comb, and then save the lice. Uh, the student here on the right was Diego, an undergraduate that worked with me at the University of New Mexico, who actually combed over uh, about 1,500 museum study skins. And then with collaborations from others, we got to over 2,000 museum study skins combed to recover specimens. For just the genomics part of it, we um, used 35 Hoploplura individuals from 19 host species, as well as one Hoploplura erratica, which is from Tamia striatus, the eastern chipmunk. So this is, should be a different species. And my original intent was to use it as an outgroup, but that didn't work, and you'll see why in a moment. And then the other louse for Neohematopinus, um, we used 21 individuals from 17 different host species. So this is the astral phylogeny that we generated using um, whole genome sequencing and then assembled loci with atrium using genes that had been identified from the human sucking louse genomes for um, about 1,100 individual genes. So this is that astral tree that has high support. So there's only a few branches that have um, support values marked on them. You can see that those are low, but most of the branches have support of one. The blocks and the branches are color-coded based on host group. So the overall message from that is that the individual lice do largely cluster based on host association or what hosts they were recovered from. There's a few exceptions to that. Um, one of them being the speciosis. So on the bottom part here, there's a kind of gold and gray gold or 
green gold color. And you can see that there's one speciosis that is separate from the other speciosis. So this is one instance where the lice are not strictly sorting out based on host associations. There's a few other examples where you can see that the dorsalis louse here and the dorsalis louse here are non-sister. So this suggests that there's some element of geography in addition to host association that is shaping these relationships. And then the last thing I wanna point out here is that the Hoploplura erratica, the Eastern chipmunk louse is outlined here in this red box. And as you can see, it is with, well within the clade of the, or well nested within the Hoploplura arboricola phylogeny. So this tree was actually rooted with the Neohematopinus sample. Um, so this has presents a few problems, one of them being that there's something wrong here. Obviously we need to take a look at taxonomy. There are a few morphological characters that dis are supposed to distinguish Hoploplura erratica from Hoploplura arboricola, but they are very subtle in my opinion. And um, so we're gonna take another look at that and also examine a few more samples to make sure that this isn't some weird spurious issue, but it's not identical to any of the others. And so it doesn't look like it was a contamination problem. And then just to show you another um, point, this is the IQ tree. So this is the concatenated tree for all 1106 genes. And again, it's highly supported, but I wanted to show you this to see that there's incredibly short branch lengths here. So this suggests that the diversification times that's going on within these host associated clades um, are, are recent. And this hasn't been um, necessarily going on for very long, but without dating, we can't say much more than that. So then to look at the Neohematopinus tree, again, this is the astral tree. It's very well supported. And again, the groups seem to cluster based on host associations. The one that I want to point out here that there's a few differences. Um, the first being that this alpinus louse that's right here nested within the speciosis clade, the alpinus louse from the other species. So the Hoploplura alpinus louse was actually nested within minimus, which is what we would expect based on host associations or host relationships. But here, both of these lice are actually collected from the same locality. So it looks like they're sharing louse lineages at that locality. The other interesting thing is that this um, quad E and quad W group, so the quad rotatus east and quad rotatus west group, they are non-sister. And all of those hosts are actually one species group. And in Hoploplura, they all came out as one clade. So this suggests that there's definitely different dynamics going on in shaping the histories of how these different life species are becoming associated with the hosts that we see them with today. Again, here's the IQ concatenated tree and again, well supported, but just these incredibly short branch lengths. So these are all really recent diversification events that are, we're seeing. So the last thing I did is I wanted a really precise comparison of these two lice and how they're diversifying with respect to their hosts. So I subsampled to only have lice represented from the same host individual. So there's 16 individual chipmunks where I had one Hoploplura louse and one Neohematopinus louse that I was able to sample. There was one instance where there was some Tamius Townsendii lice that were from different host individuals collected at the same locality. And um, I did the concatenated IQ tree for each species independently and then generated concordance factors for each species gene trees to the concatenated trees. So um, another way to look at it is a little more visually. So I have one chipmunk, I have a Hoploplura and a Neohematopinus from that chipmunk, generated gene trees, also generated a concatenated tree of Hoploplura, a concatenated tree for Neohematopinus. And then IQ tree, in IQ tree, I generated concordance factors um, for the gene trees for, with each species tree. So the way these are going to be displayed is the concordance factors for the same species tree and gene trees will be on top, and then the other species gene trees will be on the bottom. So this is the Hoploplura arboricola tree, and you can see that the concordance factors, which are on the top of the ratio here for the Hoploplura gene trees, are all almost all higher than the Neohematopinus trees. Um, and, but there are a few instances where they're both relatively high. So this suggests that there is a small amount of gene tree species tree discordance, which is not unusual, but overall the numbers are a lot lower. So these are percentages. So this is saying 0.09% of the Neohematopinus trees had this branch in them.
So the white dots indicate the nodes that were shared between both of the species trees, both of the concatenated trees, and there were very few of them and they were at shallow nodes. So this reflects that there are host associated relationships, host associated clades in both species of lice, but that the relationships among those host associated clades are very different. And again, this is the Neohematopinus tree. So this is the same thing. The Neohematopinus concatenated tree with the concordance factors for the gene trees plotted on there. And overall, there is, um, there's more concordance for the Neohematopinus trees than the Arbopopla trees, which are shown on the bottom. But again, there's some instances here where we can see some gene tree species tree discordance, as I said, not terribly unexpected, um, but it shows us that there's this different history shaping these relationships. So these lice, both of these lice species, love species have diversified in some manner that reflects their host affiliations, but it's all at a very shallow level. So the deep history of the lice doesn't seem to be reflecting the host associations. And that um, I can simply say this based on the fact that they both have different host associations. With a little bit more work and better dating, I'm hoping I can get a more precise comparison between the chipmunks and their host, or the lice and their host chipmunk species. But right now, what we're seeing is a different pattern of diversification in the two lice species, as well as some similar geographic patterns, but these are not necessarily phylogenetic. Uh, there are some aspects of this diversification, which is repeated ac across the parasite species, but that's mostly this clustering of host affiliations. We don't, neither louse lineage Neither louse species has one lineage that's widespread among a whole bunch of um, unrelated chipmunks. And that we see this landscape scale structure, which suggests there's something going on, likely with the history of how chipmunks are interacting with one another on the landscape that's shaping this, these relationships. Um, next thing, my next project is going to be working on some phylogenomic tests with the hosts, generating phylogenomic trees and doing some tests with that. And then I'd like to test for selection on these lice to see if there's any genes that we can be identified that may be associated with different patterns of host affiliation. And then also I've done some work with the chipmunk pinworms and looking more closely at the patterns with them. There's a lot of people to thank. I've had a lot of support for this project um, from my PhD work all the way through my postdoc, as well as a lot of sources of funding and museums have provided samples. So with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Chase. All right, I see a question from Raina. Do the two species vary in abundance on a given host? So yeah, they, um, they do, <laughs> is the short answer. So this is the slide that's showing the two species. I tend to find more Hoploplura arboricola than Neohaemonopinus on a host. They're more common in general and also tend to be more abundant when I do find them both. This is a lot of hand waving, but if you actually line up the distances on the trees, I suspect that Hoploplura has been actually associated with chipmunks longer than Neohematopinus, and that that may be why they are potentially more successful with the chipmunks. Um. Raina said, also just wanted to say it's so cool that Oops. you can use museum specimen for this work. Um, and then Elise asked, thanks for the talk, very cool. Have you looked at hybridization or introgression between the lice lineages? I haven't looked at anything that kind of scale with the lice. Um, one, of the one of the reasons this isn't published yet is actually because I'm having to go back and do um, mitochondrial genes <laughs> because um, I didn't fail to do, I did get them done in the first run of this. So I'm actually doing that now. And that's one of the things I'm gonna look at is concordance between those. I haven't looked in detail at any other levels of gene tree discordance with the nuclear genes to see if there's any signals of hybridization. Awesome, thank you Chase right. once again. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Philip Skipwith. Philip is a postdoc at the American Museum of Natural History. <laughs> although he will soon be starting as an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky. The title of his talk is Phylogenomics and Microevolution of Australasian Geckos. Thank you, Athena. Thanks everyone for uh, listening today. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen. Yes. Um, so 
Uh, today we're talking about the phylogenomics and uh, macroevolution narrative dynamics of a group of geckos that, been, that are near and dear to my heart. Um, by training, I'm a uh, molecular phylogeneticist, and but what really interests me um, is less so much about the genome and more about trait diversification and speciation dynamics across time. So what really uh, started me on this project uh, was I worked on one particular group of geckos. I'll introduce them in the next slide. Um, but with anybody who does molecular systematics, uh, you know, one of the issues that you have is, will more data get me a better answer or at the very least a different answer, but with smaller data? So the group I work on has been addressed with numerous attempts to address uh, problematic relationships with uh, mitochondrial data or small amounts of nuclear data, typically um, less than 10 loci. So anyone in any uh, taxonomic group trying to address uh, poorly resolved relationships or at least incongruences between different parts of the genome um, uh, will have the same issue. If I throw more data, will I get a, a better or different answer? It's a statistical issue. Um, but what really drives my interest um, are how uh, species diversify, how lineages diversify first, and the tempo of speciation, how this relate, um, relates to um, trait diversification and this is all under uh, the, this uh, uh, phenomenon of adaptive radiation. And for those in the room who don't really study adaptive radiation, uh, that iteration, just in a nutshell, is that both species accumulation and ecological diversification are correlated to uh, ecological opportunity. So in theory, as a lineage occupies a new um, uh, area of ecospace, that the tempo of speciation will increase um, change and that the phenotypic diversification as they explore ecological opportunity will also be correlated with um, non new species formation. And just to highlight this with the cartoon, a really simple uh, cartoon of uh, two different lineages of lizards um, from a common ancestor and a non-adaptive radiation where you have species diversifying, but there isn't an ecological component to that diversification where you had different species typically allopatrically distributed that, um, that uh, more or less do the same thing. They are phenotypically and ecologically um, replaceable with one another, as opposed to an adaptive radiation where you can have um, from a single common origin, and a great example of this would be, say, on the island, where you have a single propagule that reaches an island, um, and they have no competitors. There's this big, diverse island, um, and over time, particularly very um, quickly, at least in theory, um, you can, from a single common ancestor, have a series of lineages where, in this case, color represents ecology, and shape and size represent phenotype, or you can have this diversification um, uh, along ecology and phenotype, and this is typically thought to be correlated um, with the tempo of speciation. So the group I work on are a group of geckos, in my opinion, the coolest group of lizards in the world, um, called the diplodactyloid geckos, and they are entirely endemic to Australasia. Um, just for anybody who doesn't know what a gecko is, geckos are just a group of lizards. Um, they're typically as a sister group of most other lizards. Um, and they are the only really big assemblage of primarily nocturnal lizards. Most lizards are diurnal, and these guys are nocturnal. They have a lot of weird suits of traits that allow them to, to operate at night. Um, and there, if you see a lizard running around on your wall at night um, in like a, a resort in the tropics, it's typically thought of as a gecko. But this group is really cool because geckos are a really old lineage of lizards, but these guys represent the sister um, lineage of all other geckos. Um, and they're not terribly diverse. There are almost 1,700 species of gecko in the world, um, but there are only about 200 species. So it represents about 12% of the diversity of, of geckos in the world, diplodactyloids. Um, but they're restricted entirely to four major areas in Oceania. The bulk of their diversity um, is contained on the island of Australia. There's been a single species um, that dispersed from Australia to New Guinea in the last few million years. But then I want to draw your attention to the right side of the screen. Um, in the Tasman Sea, there are two islands, New Caledonia and New Zealand, which each have their own endemic radiations of diplodactylid. Um, and these guys are really cool because these guys are typically thought of as adaptive radiations. They are typically assumed to have higher rates of speciation um, than the, the background rate for uh, geckos. I mean, diplodactyloid geckos. And they also have a really wide range of body size. So all these images are scaled to one another in size. 
and they range um, in over an order of magnitude in body size. Or some of the smallest and the largest guys are also species are also found um, on these islands and not on the mainland. So not only are these guys geographically confined and really diverse on body size, they're ecologically very, very diverse. Um, I didn't mention this before, but they're split into three different families. And they, even though they only encompass about 12% of species diversity of geckos, these guys encompass all of the morphological diversity you see within the clade coda. Um, so there are, in the upper left-hand corner, we have um, lichen mimics, we have other species. Um, that when they autonomize their tail, the tail actually screams, it makes noise all on its own. We have species that specialize in eating only hard um, shelled arthropods. We have others that look like snakes. They're the only group of geckos that have exhibited limb loss. We have other geckos that feed on nectar and others that eat um, feed ex almost exclusively on other lizards. So they're incredibly diverse in phenotype and ecology. So it's a perfect example or a perfect system in which to study uh, adaptive radiation. And given their diversity, they had been the subject of numerous um, attempts to address the phylogeny using molecular methods. But the problem is, is that this group is, uh, a lot of these relationships are very, very poorly resolved. And people have typically relied almost entirely on the mitochondrial genome, which obviously does not represent the entire evolutionary history of the lineage. Um, and furthermore, even when there, there have been nuclear loci included, it's typically under 10 loci. So to address this, um, these taxonomic issues, I uh, use ultra-conserved elements using this the generic tetrapod or amniote um, kit set for 5,000 loci uh, to try to resolve some of these taxonomic issues. And, but to also test, you know, do we get a better tree from the, uh, the smaller mitochondrial loci or the smaller Sanger loci, concatenated um, Sanger loci um, data sets? But also, is it topologically very different than what we would see and the smaller Sanger Lotus set, low set um, data sets. So first, we got had very high success. So I sequenced um, over 300 um, individuals, representing 75% of the species diversity of diplodactyloids, so about 180 species. Um, and the average coverage was about 220x, which is very good. Um, and what's really interesting is that we find that when you look at, when you interrogate the um, data set, just like with exons, um, such as anchor tags or other exon um, custom exonic data sets, um, UCEs are uh, the phylogenetic information content uh, ultra-conserved elements is tightly correlated with the actual length of a um, of a of a locus. So the longer the locus is, the more phylogenetically informative sites that we have. It's not surprising, but what's um, uh, we're actually able to show is that when you compare them to uh, comparative uh, uh, amni or tetrapod groups of the same phylogenetic depth, so about 70 million years, uh, you actually find that UCEs are significantly less informative per locus than exons, which is not surprising. That's why uh, people use UCEs because they are conserved across multiple taxonomic groups. So I used two basic uh, 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 phylogenetic reconstruction methods to recover the phylogeny for this group. First, concatenation using maximum likelihood. Um, but then also using summary coalescent with uh, star and astral. And when you actually interrogate this data set to see, um, do I actually need 4,000 loci to recover the full topology of the 4,200 loci um, species tree? We actually find that the individual UCEs actually do a pretty good job by themselves. So you only need about a quarter of that number of UCEs to recover uh, the topology of the 4200 species tree. And the way I did this was I generated, randomly sampled uh, 10 loci from, uh, or I'm sorry, 10 alignments uh, from the full uh, 4200 locus data set um, for various bin sizes. So from 10 loci all the way up to 4000 loci, built maximum likelihood phylogenies, and then computed the tree to tree distance from each one of those bins to the full data set. So once you get to about a thousand loci, you can actually recover about 90% of the nodes that you see um, in the 4200 um, uh, locus data set, which is actually pretty good. So this can be used down the road for a custom set um, UCE sets for geckos in the future. So now I'm going to talk more about the macroevolutionary dynamics of this group because that's what really interests me. Um, the, I mentioned before, briefly before, if you remember from that slide of Australasia, um, 
I talked about New Caledonia, New Zealand being considered special and um, typically thought of as having uh, higher rates of speciation in the background rates of for diplodactylids. Um, and this was typically thought of because these uh, two lineages independently colonized these um, regions within the last 30 million years via long distance overall dispersal from Eastern Australia. And what we actually find is when you actually use birth, various birth death models of speciation, regardless of whether or not you're looking at instantaneous, instantaneous rates of speciation or extinction um, along a branch or at the node, we actually find that uh, across that all diplodactyls share more or less the same speciation rate. There are no significant outliers. There are no rate shifts within diplodactyls, which is not what you would expect with adaptive radiation theory. With adaptive radiation theory, I had hypothesized that the New Caledonia and New Zealand diplodactyls would have higher rates of speciation rate um, give, um, versus the background rate. And this is just one plot showing that from the posterior of this program CLADS, which looks like speciation rates along um, um, branches, we find that there is no significant um, outlier. You see similar patterns with BAM or looking at spectral distances using um, R panda. But when you uh, look at trait diversification, you see a very different pattern. Um, typically, um, in adaptive radiation theory, you expect that if you have higher rates of speciation, you would also have quarterly high rates of trait diversification as these lineages, as you're making new lineages, um, they're forced to occupy new areas of morphous space until they're hit a cap, right? So there's a theoretical um, carrying capacity. This is analogous to um, density dependence in population biology. At the, um, uh, at the higher taxonomic levels, there's this idea of diversity dependence. I'm not really going to talk too much about that because um, there are a lot of issues of why you would actually not, um, why molecular phylogenies are not particularly robust systems in which to test this. Um, you need uh, uh, data from the fossil record. But what we find um, is that trait diversification is decoupled from speciation rate in this system. Um, and to test this, I actually went and measured over a thousand specimens, including specimens from the Calicat, from Australia and New Zealand, um, and used uh, uh, 16 linear traits, external traits, to uh, see how traits diversify across this phylogeny. I'm not going to talk about the topology of, of the phylogeny because I could sit here all day and talk about how it's different than um, published data sets. But what we find is of the 16 traits, we only see three that show rate heterogeneity in which we give over the background rate, we see um, a rate shift um, um, using a simple Brownian motion operator. This is using BAM. So for body size, we find that the island guys, uh, New Zealand and New Caledonia again, um, have higher rates of body size evolution, sometimes an order of magnitude higher than what you see in mainland Australia. On the right, I'm showing uh, the, uh, uh, just the, uh, the rate where we have the, the heavy line represents the mean rate of, of body size evolution or trait diversification, while the opaque area represents 95% con um, um, credibility intervals. Um, we also see increased rates of uh, the relative limb length in um, New Caledonia. But then on the mainland, we see decreased rates of um, relative toe dimension, evolution of toe dimensions um, uh, um, in one lineage of Australian gecko. So what does all, all this mean? Um, again, anybody doing phylogenomics is probably gonna find a similar pattern where you're getting, first off, a very different tree and a better supported tree than uh, the, um, than with smaller Sanger data sets. Um, and with, in this case, we find that, whereas in previously previously published smaller Sanger data sets, typically you're only getting about half of the phylogeny get strong statistical support, regardless of whether or not you're using bootstraps or uh, posterior probability estimates from um, Bayesian inference. In this case, we're actually able to recover about 95% of nodes in the phylogeny. Furthermore, um, when you compare the topology of these of this data set to previously uh, previous Sanger data sets of ten loci or smaller, um, they only recover um, so uh, agree on about sixty percent of nodes. So this tree is first off be um, statistically better supported than any previous data set, but it is topologically vastly different than any other study. It's an entirely novel tree. And in addition to that, using UCEs. Um, we recover pretty slightly different um, divergence time estimates for these lineages where uh, the crown age is about 70 million years. Um, and that the island rate, even though the clade itself is actually quite old, the island radiations are really, really young. 
So this recapitulates this idea that these guys got to these islands via a long um, overwater dispersal versus um, a vicariance event um, um, sometime during the Cretaceous. But in terms of adaptive radiation, this uh, they're beginning a, like, like a murky picture in terms of how speciation and trait diversification uh, relate to one another. So in terms of trait diversification, it seems that en islands are engines of biodiversity, but that trait diversification is not wholesale, that you don't see rate shifts um, um, across the entire body of an organism, or rather that some traits may in fact be more labile and um, diversification. We don't really understand this, at least in the context of um, this particular system. So we're investigating that now. But just as an example, it seems like body size, if you're on the island, it may be easier to expand your body size envelope um, because that functionally um, changes where you would live in the environment as opposed to things that have um, that may have more to do with biomechanics, such as limb dimensions or how your, um, your cranium works, which I'm now investigating with um, CT scan, um, scans. Um, also, uh, uh, like I mentioned before, this idea, this relationship between speciation and trait diversification, um, there really is no real reason to, uh, when you really sit there and think about it, to think of as traits and speciation being um, necessarily related to one another, unless the traits in question have something to do with reproductive isolation in lineages. And, and many lineages might, this might actually be true in terms of key innovations where you evolve a new trait and that increases speciation rates or new species evolving may facilitate the evolution of new traits and open the ecological space. But that requires a really strong understanding of how these traits um, function um, in a functional sense. We don't, for most non-model systems, we have no idea um, how reproductive isolation and traits um, are related to one another. Um, so in terms of adaptive radiation, uh, again, we find that the island radiations are uh, quite uh, quite special in terms of trait diversification, but um, speciation um, seems to be relatively conserved across this um, clade. So with that, I would like to thank um, my uh, collaborators in Australia and at the Museum of um, Natural History and at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology um, at Berkeley and this, as a museum scientist, this wouldn't have been possible without the help of various uh, collections managers and curators um, here in the US and Australia and New Zealand. So with that, I will uh, take any questions. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Raina already has a question. Are there really big geckos in NC and NZ occupying niches that are occupied by other lizard lineages in Australia? Um, so that's a, a very good question. I didn't really get to go into that. I could talk all day about the natural history of these guys. So the really big geckos in New Zealand and Cal New Caledonia are actually uh, canopy specialists. And this is something you see um, globally in lizards where if you have an arboreal lineage, um, lizard li um, lineage, particularly on islands, the really big guys typically live higher up than the really small guys. Um, and in Australia, you don't really see canopy giants. Um, most, most geckos in Australia are uh, mo small to moderate size. You don't see any really huge guys. So no, there really isn't a lot of niche overlap with the giants in Australia and the insular giants. Great. Edward said, great talk. You mentioned that some island radiations are relatively young and the mitochondrial DNA versus species tree have really different topologies. Is there any signature of reticulation in the geno genomic data? So that's a project I'm currently working on and it's in its infancy right now. Um, at least in New Caledonia, because that, again, I didn't talk too much about this for the sake of time, but New Caledonia is a really young radiation in um, evolutionary times, about 18 million years. And there's at least some evidence that um, there is mitochondrial introgression between vastly different, or at least morphologically different taxa in this lineage and not and the signatures of uh, nuclear introgression in the opposite direction for uh, different lineages in the same clade. Does that make sense? So, but this is still very preliminary. Cool. And Matt asks, are there any geckos in Vanuatu. So Vanuatu is an island to the east of New Caledonia.
Um, there are, but they're not part of this assemblage. There, there, there are different, totally unrelated group of geckos that are called geconoids. And Vanuatu's gecko um, radiate. The nice thing about Australasia is that diplodacoids are pretty mon pretty constrained or monophyletic. And when you go elsewhere in Oceania, outside of Australasia, um, you uh, start to get this weird hodgepodge of different lineages colonizing from Asia and outside of Oceania that are not diplodactyloids. So there isn't a lot of in-situ diversification on Vanuatu.